everybody, it's Dave the Clone, your favorite water cooler movie chatter upper guy. Coming back to you with another installment in our 15 minutes of movie memory madness podcast. I don't know why I'm being so robotic with the way I say that, but if I'm following programs and protocols, let me say, if you've come this far and you've been with us this many episodes, I know you've already smashed that like and subscribe button as well as the bell icon so that you're made aware of any time new content is uploaded to the channel. But if you haven't done that, do all the things I just said so that uh, you can stay in the know so that we don't have to send a mythical creature to resurrect you from the grave and bring you back to the place where the pain that was made took place for you to take your revenge on missing out. I am being very, very on the nose or on the beak if you want. With uh, with introducing today's uh, selection, this one's a big one for me. Um, quick impression for you. Okay, action. Bang, fuck, I'm dead. Oh my god, I can't believe I did that. I've been thinking about doing that for two days. But uh, yeah, this one, we're doing 1994's The Crow, the tragic final performance by the late, great Brandon Lee. Um, and now, cult classic, we're coming up on... 30 years again for the um, folks at home keeping score. This is a 30 year anniversary look back, I guess. Plus, there were just about 31 years this month. The month of March will be the 31st anniversary of the untimely passing of Brandon Lee. And I think that's where I want to start with today's sort of nostalgic look back because you know, that's really what this podcast is all about, is, is a, a movie fanatic remembering what it was like when these movies were brand new, like what my first experiences with these movies were, and how those experiences may have changed over the decades of continuing to be a movie fanatic, um, and sort of becoming more and more disillusioned with the modern movies, and trying to figure out why. You know, we're trying to look at what it is about these movies that happened to come out during my formative years, maybe. And that's not to say I won't do anything more recent either, but... It seems like the 80s and 90s during my childhood and early uh, adolescence were sort of maybe could be considered, especially by those who've been around long enough to have experienced it, like a peak of the art, a golden era, so to speak, and that what we've moved into now has been sort of a downward trajectory with obvious, you know, exceptions here and there. There have been still some incredible um, pieces of filmmaking that have happened in the last 20 years, 10 years, somewhere in between. Um, But nothing like the way movies like this one, like The Crow or like Pulp Fiction that we spoke about recently, kind of really left a mark that then shifted things or or just made people think about movies differently. But um, this one... This one's got a lot of personal connection for me. Um, When Brandon Lee passed away, may he rest in peace, son of the legendary Bruce Lee, who also um, died young and died in an accident on a movie set, making a movie. So there was um, all kinds of things. And and think about this happening in an era before social media, before the Internet. I found out that he was that he had passed away when a friend of mine, I would have been in eighth grade because the, he passed away in 1993. The movie was then subsequently completed and released in 1994. And around that time, at least for me, I had only just become aware of Brandon Lee as a person, as an actor, as a talent, because I had recently seen the movie Showdown in Little Tokyo, which was his sort of entree into the mainstream film world for at least for America anyway, where he co-starred with Dolph Lundgren. And it was like a big deal, like you know, Bruce Lee's son is now making movies and of course he's bringing the martial arts and he's kind of an awesome, he was awesome in like, uh, in Showdown for Little Tokyo, he's definitely one of the highlights of the movie, um, which also starred Kari Hiroyuki Tagawa, who I had the chance to meet at uh, New York Comic Con in 2015. 
2013, I believe. It was maybe 2014. In any case, um, so he had left an impression with me, and I hadn't seen Rapid Fire at that point, which was his follow-up to Showdown in Little Tokyo and the first movie where he was the star. And it would have been, I would have been in eighth grade, and... Um, I always got dropped off a little bit early because I think at that time my mom was going back to school and my dad would drop my sisters and I off at school on his way to work. And so for folks who showed up early to school, the cafeteria was always open and you could go sit at the tables and you know either work on homework or just kind of hang out with your friends. You didn't have to be outside. Um, and so in the winter time, you know, or towards the end of the winter, beginning of spring before it was warm enough to kind of hang out outside, definitely the cafeteria was the place to be. And I'm sitting there doing homework that I hadn't finished from the night before. And my friend, coincidentally, also named Brandon, and also half American, half Asian. So he, and he looked a little like Brandon Lee actually comes in. And the first thing he says to me, cause we were at that point sort of a little obsessed with movies like Showdown in Little Tokyo, action movies. And we talked a lot about, we both were big fans of Brandon Lee. Only, I don't know. I felt there was sort of like this weird heartless way he came and he goes, yo, you know, Brandon Lee got shot. And I was like, what? Is he okay? And he's like, nah, man, he's dead. And I, was like almost beside myself. It was like the same level as uh, anyone who was a teenager in the 70s, um, and, the, and especially if they were a drummer on the day they found out John Bonham had passed away. You know, people who would, and I hadn't really experienced this so much with, with celebrity deaths at that point. Um, and I don't know that as many had affected me as much as this one did maybe until Robin Williams passed away. But I was like depressed for the whole day and I had to, it was one of those things where it's like, this was the first thing I heard before going to my first class of the day. And I had to kind of make it through the rest of the day, trying to not think about it. But I was, I was definitely affected. I was upset. And then I remember, um, my dad took me to dinner. Uh, we went to Friendly's for dinner. I was talking about Brandon Lee for weeks, you know what I mean? I was just talking about him for days and days and days and days. And even my dad was like, yeah, you know, that is really sad. And I think my dad, one of the great things about my dad, may he rest in peace, was that he he seemed to pick up on when it was a good time to empathize, you know, instead of trying to, instead of what more was more typical in the 80s and 90s when you know, kids were kind of obsessed with things that were maybe less priority in life. You know, like, okay, it's someone you didn't know, who, it's a movie star, it's a celebrity very far removed from your life. You kind of need to get over it and get your homework done. He was pretty good about um, kind of understanding that it was affecting me and bothering me. And so this was also in the period of time where I was renting movies pretty regularly. You know, I would walk on the way home from school I'd stop at the video store to return whatever I'd rented the day or two prior, and I would always rent something else. I'd very rarely just go home empty-handed. So, of course, um, I had Little T Showdown in Little Tokyo on VHS at home, and now it was time to watch Rapid Fire. And then I became obsessed with Rapid Fire. That year, I must have rented Rapid Fire several times. I made sure to have a bunch of friends watch it as well. Um, in one of my art classes at school, we were making silk screened t-shirts and I made a rapid fire in honor of Brandon Lee t-shirt, but we also had heard that he passed away making this movie called The Crow. And it, it was weird because this was a time where like, you know, we didn't have footage. We didn't have stuff leaking to the internet. We didn't have the internet. So when the news organizations were talking about the death of Brandon Lee, they say he passed away making a movie called The Crow about a rock star who comes back from the grave to avenge the death of himself and his murdered girlfriend. They would be showing footage from Rapid Fire. <laughs> so I was like, all right, let me go watch rapid fire but i was always keeping my ear to the ground as much as you could back then which for the most part meant watching tv watching the entertainment magazine shows like entertainment tonight and um yeah, pretty much entertainment tonight. Uh, you know, MTV was a pretty good source for pop culture news. And then um, the radio. We used to have this really awesome radio station in uh, the suburbs of New York and in New York City called Q104.3, New York's Pure Rock. That station was kind of a mainstay. Um, at some point during my high school career, maybe my junior year of high school, it changed from 
New York's pure rock to classic rock. And I remember the day that happened, everybody was like, what the hell? Because like, you know, once you tune the dial, we didn't have digital yet. A lot of us had stereos that actually had a dial with us, with just like you would move, you'd see the slider moving along to let you know approximately where, <laughs> where you were tuned into. And once you got Q104.3 on the dial, you don't touch the dial again. And so, you know, obsessed with what with rapid fire waiting to and all of a sudden the following year my freshman year of high school 1994 we start seeing commercials for the crow and it looked pretty damn cool you know a sort of very dark gothy kind of um we didn't have a name for it at the time but that sort of death rock kind of you know very kiss inspired with the way the makeup was and i also did not know until the movie had already sort of become a thing that it was based on a comic book but i was you know really keeping track of what was happening with the movie and it was to the point where q104.3 had a couple things going on they had um one night it was like you could call in and if you were the 10th caller or the something number caller or like the next few callers like you could you could wind up winning a pack of cds and it was like the like movie soundtracks that were like hot movie soundtracks at the time so it was the higher learning soundtrack that featured rage against the machine it was the jerky boy soundtrack that featured uh, collective soul because i think they did gel all these were songs that were being played on q104.3 at the time um the SFW soundtrack, which I don't know what they were playing off of that on Q104.3, but it had, um, what's it called? Suicidal Tendencies. That's what they were playing. No fucking problem. And the Crow soundtrack, because you had both Nine Inch Nails and The Cure on there. But what was making its way on the radio at that time was the Stone Temple Pilots song, Big Empty. So this was one of the first times where I got a bunch of movie soundtracks to movies I hadn't even seen yet because I think the soundtracks came out first. And that was one of those things that back then you was sort of like, we didn't understand the marketing machine. It was like, why would you release the soundtrack before the movie came out? Who's going to buy that? But people did. Mostly just because these were also just really cool compilation albums if you didn't even wind up seeing the movie. So called in on a Saturday night, won those... Um, won the cds and then a week later or maybe it was because i won the cd i got entered into a, a drawing or maybe it was like you if you were within this like window and this was the kind of thing where if you had to be a certain number caller you just kept calling you know what i mean like you'd call you would find out what number you are if you weren't the one you'd hang up and call right back and so i did that i wound up getting through i got the cd pack and i got to attend a preview screening of the crow in the city and it was like maybe two weeks before it opened in the theaters for everybody else so i suddenly felt super special and like all this kind of time that i had spent being upset about the death of brandon lee was at least being served in some way um and assuaged in some way by getting this kind of like connection to the movie so i uh Got my dad to go with me. I got two tickets to this thing, and my dad drove us into the city, and I got to watch it. It was just, it wasn't anything special. It wasn't red carpet. There were no stars there. Um, it was just a screening of the movie, clumsily introduced by a DJ from the radio station at the time. Um, there were a few hats and T-shirts that were given out, but I remember standing in the line with folks that like was around the block waiting to go into this thing and yeah we got to watch the movie and you know so there's a certain level of i mean the movie's awesome let's let's get that out of the way <laughs> let's not let's not let anything i could possibly say um that would detract from the fact that this movie is awesome. It's also very much a movie of its time. Uh, we don't see a lot of movies like this anymore. In fact, the whole sort of resurgence of comic book movies, a lot of people are saying, you know, everyone overlooks the fact that movies like The Crow and Blade with Wesley Snipes from a few late years later, I believe it was 1998? Yeah, Blade was in the theaters in 98. So that was the year I graduated. So the two years, the beginning year and ending year of high school had these really sort of dark, action-heavy comic book properties turned into serious, taking themselves seriously movies. And it kind of set the stage for, obviously, of course, also Batman 1989, set the stage for there is a market to be made and there is an audience to be found for 
comic book movies that treat the stories seriously and not like cartoons. But this one was really different, man. I mean, it was brutal, you know, and I didn't find out until the credits of this movie rolled and said based on the comic book by James Obar, who I did have the chance to actually meet in 2012 in Chicago. And he, his table was right across the aisle from the table that I was at with the podcasting group I was with at the time. So at some point during the second day I was there, I was just like, hold on a second, I'll be right back. And I went over, I shook his hand. I'm like, I just got to tell you, man, the crow was such an impact in my life and the movie was fantastic and I just I just really wanted you to know how much I thought it was awesome and he he was kind of reserved and he just kind of shook his head and said thanks and shook my hand he didn't shake his head he nodded his head and said thanks and shook my hand and uh it's ironic that I remember that being so sort of an awkward because that was the first year I was really meeting celebrities I got to meet Cheryl Lee and Sherilyn Fenn from Twin Peaks which is another property that was very important to me and impactful for me um during my formative years and and currently still now i watch it a lot um and so you know the, the experience of meeting people like that was a little bit different than meeting this guy it almost seemed like it was interesting that he was even there from how sort of quiet and kind of to himself he was and after the movie you know the movie so a lot of the people in line at the movie were talking about oh you know they moved they made this movie in reverse so all the stuff from the end of the, the you know from a third of the movie through the end of the movie it's all brandon lee it's all him they they were able to film all that but it was the beginning of the movie that they hadn't filmed yet so all the sort of cg and double work is going to be in the opening sequences which happened to be the scenes where we see how he was murdered and um, for the longest time, I thought he wound up getting accidentally killed during the scene where his character was murdered in the film. And it turns out that he actually um, was killed in a scene that does exist in the movie. It's in the middle of the movie, and it had to have been like an alternate take um, where they had filmed enough of it for the scene. You know, you wouldn't imagine that this is the scene where he died. It, it would almost seem like it would be in line with what he felt was a curse that was over his sort of family bloodline. He actually thought he was going to pass away making a movie like his father did, and it sort of uh, morbidly came true. Uh, in fact, John Polito, another fa fantastic and epic, as far as his library of work is concerned, character actor, who you see in a lot of the um, Coen Brothers films, especially Miller's Crossing and uh, the Big Lebowski, he's the brother Seamus who's following the dude. Um, I was just, in the research I was doing to get ready for this episode, uh, it's apparently, allegedly, one, the, the production itself, director Alex Proyas, uh, I think James Obar it has writing credit on the movie along with two other writers um, who were David Show and John Shirley. Um, the, the the set had a lot going on. There was uh, a, a carpenter set builder who wound up accidentally driving a screwdriver through his hand. A production truck caught on fire. One of the um, one of the PAs or someone was at some point uh, upset with something that was going on and wound up driving his car into one of the sets and destroying all the props and everything that were uh, that were created for the movie so there was a lot of sort of what's going on here type stuff hanging around this production and um in one of the scenes in the movie uh brandon lee after having come back from the dead so he's a uh, his character is eric draven a local musician and this is all taking place in a very dark and scary version of Detroit where every year on Devil's Night uh, gangs and criminals across the city will set uh, like so many buildings on fire that it has just become a tradition and um, he and his girlfriend Shelly <laughs> fiance Shelly are sort of brutally attacked and murdered by a gang of criminals uh, who were working at the behest of a local crime lord to sort of clear out the building that they were in so that they'd be able to use the building for their criminal activities. But she drew their ire uh, by creating a petition to 
have them address a few of the building code violations and you know um, rodent and um, vermin infestations normal things that people who live in an apartment building you would think it would be okay to do um, but this is a Detroit very much of a comic book world and so you know at this period of time 80s 90s sort of uh, tropey characters like an alley thug <laughs> or, or, or like a career criminal who basically somehow can eke out a living as a purse, purse snatcher or part of a crew of criminals that do uh, petty, petty thievery, also arson, also racketeering, um, were kind of what we people from the suburbs thought were just roving around the cities. And I'm sure maybe there are some cities where that was happening. Uh, 1980s New York, for instance, was not the safest place in the world to be. It's unfortunately supposedly going back a little towards that these days. But the time that I worked there, it felt like it was more of like a normal place, more like a demolition man style type city where everybody could just kind of walk around and mind their own business and get, get to where they need to go unscathed. But um the the Detroit in this movie is not the not the funnest place in the world to live. It seems like just a very hard life there. And so that's the beginning of the movie. Uh, we we open on the crime scene aftermath where uh, Ernie Hudson playing Officer Albrecht, uh, who I was I didn't meet directly, but I was in the green room with at Texas Frightmare. Um convention in 2018 2019 2018 i think um when i was down there uh working with a musician that i used to make music videos for uh, in any case we're gonna, we're gonna go through the list of people i have run into from this film which i i think is interesting because of how big a deal this movie was to me like bai ling this is the first time i i had ever seen bai ling um and i actually got to sort of hang out with her a little bit in 2021 at the pennsylvania horror con which is the sort of offshoot of the new jersey horror con that my i we hollow nine network our lifetime sponsors of um so, so yeah, that's sort of like a, wow, it took 20 something years, almost 30 years, but I wound up kind of connecting now with some of the folks from this movie. Um, additional people in the movie who've uh, been mainstays in the movie world. You got David Patrick Kelly uh, playing T-Bird. He's also of Twin Peaks fame, did not meet him. Um, Lawrence, oh, what's his last name? He played Lord Nikon in Hackers. Where are you? Lawrence Mason, um, Michael Massey, who is unfortunately the actor who um, experienced the onset mishap. And I, I think it's kind of interesting that this is a a mishap that resulted in a death. He, he was the one who fired the gun that was supposed to be loaded with blanks and was loaded with blanks, but the sort of the way that the, the mythos of what happened goes is when they do close-ups of revolvers, they use these dummy bullets that are just the bullet tip on an actual bullet that has no gunpowder in it or no um, striking charge, so it can't be fired. And then when they when they actually are gonna shoot the gun, they pull those out and replace them with blanks, which have the striking charge and the gunpowder, but no actual bullet tip. So you get the explosion effect of a gunshot with no projectile coming out. And one of the videos I watched on YouTube said that what allegedly happened, and this is a story I had read in a magazine at the time as well, was that they did the close-up shooting for the shot of the revolver with these dummy bullets in it they stopped for the night the armor the armorer <laughs> or the person on set in charge of the guns had gone home for the night and their assistant took the gun and didn't realize that when they um emptied it that one of the bullet tips wound up getting caught and staying in the actual barrel of the gun. So the following day, without checking, they just loaded it up with the blanks and started getting ready to shoot. So when the, when the actor, Michael Massey, playing Fun Boy, pulled the trigger, he wound up firing a blank, which again is the gunpowder and striking charge, that had a bullet tip in front of it, and that's what he, you know, came out of the gun and went right into Brandon Lee. And six hours after that happened, he passed away at a hospital in, uh, they were in North Carolina, 
I forget what city they were in in North Carolina, but that's part of partly what is apparently to blame for all this is where they were filming. There was a right to work and there was less union laws and they were able to kind of cut a lot of corners and that included on, uh, you know, uh, some of the sort of uh, services that might have been if they were shooting this in Hollywood more on on their game but it's interesting because you know nowadays we have the whole situation where something pretty much exactly like this happened again on the set of a movie called Rust where Alec Baldwin wound up shooting an uh, assistant director and uh, producer with a gun that was supposed to be loaded with blanks and I think last week I saw a headline that said the armorer in that movie has been found guilty of of manslaughter because they were the ones who were supposed to make sure that there was you know no bullets in the gun so yeah that was a long <laughs> long-winded tangent there so we also have um, Bernie Hudson as I mentioned Michael Winkai we have Tony Todd showing up in this movie before uh, this is pre Candyman right so we didn't know so much who Tony Todd was uh, and Tony Todd was in a music video that I edited for uh, a client so I at least have a project featuring Tony Todd that I was involved with and then Rochelle Davis playing Sarah who is the young girl who was friends with Eric and um, Shelly Brandon Lee and his movie fiance and um, who we see in the opening scene arriving at their murder scene realizing things are going bad um, and I've met her recently at New Jersey Harcon. I think it was in 2020 and um, interesting interesting person uh, very fun to be around and um, ironically it's kind of so part of the reason I wanted to cover this movie not only because I love it but because also it's being rebooted slash remade and uh, Bill Skarsgård is playing the Eric Draven character and the first sort of images of what he's going to look like as the crow were released much to the chagrin and dismay of people like me who are fans of the original and it just looks like a total what the fucking fuck are they doing to our movie and I recently saw a TMZ article this week that Rochelle Davis also had that very same reaction so there's a lot of sensitivity around this movie especially for folks who knew Brandon Lee in real life and she has this very um very much like it's almost like an insult to his memory that they're changing it so much and um and a lot of people you know granted the film itself is not like an academy award winning movie but it was a very cool um atmospheric the action is incredible. I mean, Brandon Lee gets shot several times in this movie. One of the things about the story is that after they die, after he and his fiance are killed by this gang of criminals, a year later, a crow lands on his headstone and starts tapping on it with his beak. With his beak. And we're getting a voiceover from Rochelle Davis's character, who was young, very young at that time. I think she was like, you know, 13 or 14 years old. And she's saying, you know, um, some people say, that um, when someone dies, a crow can carry their soul back to the land of the living and um, to put right what went wrong and avenge uh, wrongful deaths, you know, I'm paraphrasing, so please fr calm down or comment, I don't care, <laughs> either way. And so a year to the day, he is brought back to life by this crow and he has powers, you know, he's invulnerable and when if he, if he gets shot, the bullet hole will close itself up um, and it's it's done so so that he is kind of this kind of a vengeful spirit and is able to have the advantage over the forces of evil that were responsible for their wrongful death um, but this all theoretically gets tested once the crow itself is hurt then the the human crow um, begins to lose those abilities so that's you know every character every superhero has to have their kryptonite that's his kryptonite the crow has to be protected um, and that doesn't really come into play until like the, la the la last act of the film really I was gonna say the later third of the film otherwise known as the last act uh, and even still though once that happens he's able to fight the main big bad top dollar terrible terrible character name played by michael wincott in a pretty cool sword fight on top of a church um and so yeah the movie itself 
Uh, interesting effect. Uh, Alex Porius has another movie called Dark City, and you can see a lot of parallels. Um, this was actually Alex Porius's first film, his first foray into feature filmmaking. And, um, yeah, the soundtrack as well played a very significant part. I mean, the sort of crow becoming the crow, you know, going from the recently newly resurrected Eric Draven to finding his old apartment all burnt out, but burnt out, but left with all kinds of memorabilia, like, you know, pictures, his, his fiance's um, makeup vanity is still there. It's sort of like one of these, wow, so they killed them and then just let the building sit for a year, kind of been condemned and just waiting for him to come back. And that's where he then paints his face. You know, there, there's a uh, comedy tragedy mask that is hanging from the mirror and sort of taking a cue from that, he puts the comedy mask on his own face in makeup form. Um, again, very influenced by Kiss. And so for the rest of the movie, he's got the white face with the extended rictus grin smile of black lipstick and the sort of blackened around his eyes with sort of clown lines coming up and from the top and bottom. And uh, yeah, it becomes pretty cool. And I think, you know, I wanted to love the movie. So when I saw it in the theater, um, the atmosphere was strange you know the, the DJ said we're watching this in honor of Brandon Lee everybody cheered and then I think because of that anything that was sort of even a moment of levity or like a comic relief moment the laughter was exaggerated in the theater we all had this kind of energy where like the action was more impactful the comedy was funnier the brutality was more brutal and the whole time you're kind of watching going art is this a shot where brandon lee got killed is this a shot where brandon lee got killed the opening sequence there is a sort of computer rendered brandon lee this is the very early days of cg so they were kind of really pushing the envelope and they got around with it there's a lot of shots where you're not seeing his face you know um he's in front of like a sunset so we're just seeing him kind of in silhouette playing guitar on, on the roof of a, a building or he's standing with his back to a window as the sun is coming up behind him and so he's just kind of a shadowy outline of himself or there's a, a body double that did a lot of kind of um interesting work in the beginning of the movie where he's kind of he's kind of going through the physical uh, remembering of being murdered and the whole time the guy's hair is hanging in his face so we don't actually see that it's not Brandon Lee and it worked I mean if you didn't know that he passed away that while they were making the movie you probably wouldn't even question it so much but I felt like it was the kind of thing we're all sitting there in the theater watching it going I understand I get it and um yeah, cool movie. He does get shot several times throughout the film, and so you kind of almost feel like they were asking for it, you know? And I watched an on-set interview with him that was being conducted by a journalist, and they were saying, you know, tell me a little bit about what you did today. He goes, well, today I got shot 20 times. I'm wearing a bulletproof vest. I've worn, I've worn squibs before. I've done stuff like this before, but, you know, on a day where you're just standing there getting shot 20 times, you don't have to do an awful lot of acting. The kind of circumstances do the acting for you. And so you start to think think, wow, man, at this point in time, they were still making movies where they would actually shoot you. <laughs> they would actually point the gun at you and shoot you. Um, I understand that some of the rules in Hollywood changed after this movie um, where everything needs to be done with sort of trick angles. You're not really ever supposed to point a gun directly at another actor if, it, if the trigger is going to be pulled. And I know after the recent um, situation with Rust, they were even talking about never using real guns again in movies. I don't believe that got very far because just try imagine a movie like John Wick where they're not using real guns, where it's all um, hard plastic uh, you know, prop guns, and then they're going to add in the muzzle flares with computers later. It's sort of like, come on. There has to be a way to be able to do this safely. We've done it for long periods of time, and only a few accidents like this. So, yeah. And, and so, as it goes, you know, a lot of my high school career was spent watching, rewatching The Crow. I did, I dressed as The Crow for Halloween for several years. Um, in fact, in my senior high school, senior yearbook, there is a photo of me as The Crow and a couple other girls who dressed as gothic girls. Um, and because of that, we, you know, the seniors are featured in Senior Dress Up Day for the, uh, for the yearbook. So that was, that was kind of cool immortalized um, forever 
And um, then, you know, fast forward a couple years, uh, it comes out on Blu-ray. And uh, at the time I was in a relationship, I was actually engaged to somebody who was six and a half, almost seven years younger than me. And on one of our movie nights, when a bunch of friends came over, uh, you know, we would we would do TV nights where we would all watch like American Horror Story on the on the, the night of a new episode. And so one night everybody came over and I was like, let's watch The Crow. And they they weren't into it, you know what I mean? Like very, very soon into the movie's beginning, they were already making fun of it, how old it looked. They kind of didn't, there was no impact there. They started having side conversations. And I was really like offended by this, you know what I mean? Because I'm like, this is like a big deal movie to me. And I know if I, if I reacted the same way to some of the movies that were big deal movies to them, it would not go unnoticed it would not go uncommented on it would not be okay um and so i think after that happened i actually had a hard time watching the crow for a little while and then all of a sudden it started popping up on the streaming services i think right now it's on both prime and paramount plus paramount was actually uh, initially involved in the movie eventually it was released by miramax but once the accident happened once brandon lee's death um happened i think it was like completely shut down and they weren't even sure if it was going to get finished or released ever and miramax kind of saved the day and injected some money to to finish the film and uh to release it um and so then the other thing to kind of after the movie after seeing it in the at that premiere i immediately went to the comic book store where i was buying my comic books and i ordered the graphic novel of the original comics it was all black and white i'm not a huge fan of that but i understand for indie comics that's a way to save money and it was definitely the comic book itself was more brutal than the movie um some of the circumstances are a little bit different but for the most part it's the same story a uh, a, a guy and his fiance are killed by a gang of criminals um mostly just because of a sort of wrong place wrong time situation where um i think they either got into a like a fender bender with them and um and uh instead of it being just kind of like a moment that comes and goes these guys get out of the car and like really fuck up this dude they shoot him in the head but he doesn't die and then he he is alive enough to watch as they all take turns like beating and raping his fiance um the comic book is almost a little bit more brutal than the movie obviously and uh and then it kind of delves into some more metaphysical like they kind of define a little bit more of the crow's powers and sort of the cycle of what happens when you're brought back by the crow um and from what i gathered from some of the research i did the comic book itself was uh the result of james obar losing his real life fiance to a drunk driving car accident so for him this this whole sort of property this whole story the comic book and then it being translated into a movie there's a lot of emotional impact so to bring this all the way back to what it was like when i met him not knowing any of these things that i now know i can understand it being hard for him to kind of like deal with somebody coming going like man i really i loved the crow that movie like really had such an impact on me it's sort of like I could imagine what might have been going through his head hearing that going, dude, you have, if it had an impact on you, you have no idea what kind of impact it had on me. And um, one of the videos I watched, one of some of the research I did, uh, he apparently didn't even want Brandon Lee at first, you know, and some he thought that it would turn the movie into more of like a, a kung fu movie instead of an actual kind of like comic book action movie, which these days I almost feel like that's kind of probably what you want. I mean, he was able to do some of the acrobatics. There were a few things in the big sort of shootout boardroom scene um, where he takes on Top Dollar and, like, everyone. So, like, you know, the four characters that killed him and his girlfriend are T-Bird, Tintin, Skank, and Fun Boy. 
All right, I'll, I'll give it to James Obar because he was in pain, but some of these character names are not great, <laughs> especially Skank. That one is terrible. Um, T-Bird, Tintin, Fun Boy, I think those all work pretty well, but Top Dollar as, a, as the head of the crime sort of syndicate that they all work for. And I've noticed that in the movie, his name is never said. You know, for the longest time, I didn't know that Top Dollar was the name of the big bad until I read the comic book and even then I sort of let myself forget it. It wasn't until I've been doing all those sort of re-watching and re-research to be able to chat about it and not sound like a blathering fool. I was quite like top dollar, really? I, 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 so this is where editing comes in, folks. This is where, you know, you want to have somebody in your mastermind of self, right? In, in the sort of your inner circle who even if they're not a creative and even if they're not a writer, even if they're not a comic book artist or a comic book person just someone to kind of read through what you're doing and give you some honest feedback like if a friend of mine's like yeah I have this great story and I read it and I go top dollar I would think about that name I don't know man I think you know find a better name that just sounds kind of dumb <laughs> it doesn't it's not a scary name t-bird the guy drives a t-bird and the the fact that it's a, got the sort of bird on the hood ornament that is reminiscent of the crow the irony that in play there kind of works tintin his his specialty is throwing knives in fact the trailer famously featured brandon lee catching a knife that's thrown at his face um Fun boy, all right, he's kind of a little bit of a drug addict and um, kind of scumbaggy, I don't know. That's okay. I feel like that would be a in the 80s, 90s gang member name. Skank. All right. Now you're just kind of not even trying. <laughs> and Top Dollar doesn't inspire like crime world leadership. I think that's probably why they made sure to not say his name in the movie. It's just, oh, that's Michael Wincott. Oh, that's the Sheriff of Nottingham from Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. And he's got Bai Ling hanging around him half naked. And they like, they have three ways and murder the, the woman that they're having three ways with and then Bai Ling cuts out her eyes and then they throw the eyeball in a cauldron of fire while they snort a giant Scarface level pile of cocaine in front of them um, yeah they set the atmosphere pretty well and I feel like all of that is undercut by the fact that the guy's name is Top Dollar so in any case that's the weakness that I'll admit to with the movie and like I said it's not an uh, Academy Award winning film but it is sort of like in the grindhouse so look and feel in the sort of setting the stage for gothy kind of Batman-esque. I mean, I think one of the posters, one of the uh, taglines is darker than the bat. So it's definitely playing in this sort of darkness of Batman, the gothicness of Batman, but on more of a street level. Um, it's just an interesting, interesting piece. And um, the fact that it was Brandon Lee's final tragically final performance lends itself to kind of having this cult-like following that it does and so um, I don't know if I'm going to see the new one I really am kind of not too thrilled with the imagery that has been leaked for it as well as the the what has been leaked as the story elements um, where he's a drug addict he and his girlfriend are drug addicts who meet in rehab and it's all about them getting clean and then falling back into it and then the murder kind of happens and i'm like yeah you're really you're really straying there have been several sequels which have all been diminishing in quality um the second one was the crow city of angels which came out two years later in 1996 in august and i remember going to see that in the theater and you know, it felt like a real rehashing of the first movie, but with a bigger budget and with different people. Um, this time it's a father and son who are murdered for accidentally stumbling upon a gang while they're murdering people uh, or they're murdering somebody in an alleyway. Um, it takes place in, obviously, City of Angels, Los Angeles. And the only connecting character is an, a, a grown-up Sarah played by a uh, different actress who works now in a tattoo parlor, and she is uh, sort of drawn to find, through her dreams, to find the newly resurrected Ash, um, played by Ra 
Bob Perez, I think is his name. In any case, he, he played um, Marius in Queen of the Damned not too long after this. Not, not great, not great, not a strong actor. Um, his makeup is a little bit cooler in this movie, and much like the first movie, there was a pretty banging soundtrack. You know, the first movie had, again, The Cure, Nine Inch Nails, Stone Temple Pilots, Medicine, My Life with a Thrill Kill Cult, Golgotha Tenement Blues, um, who else? Helmet is on there. Uh, yeah. The only thing I didn't like, the only song I thought that should not have been in included at all, and I think may have been included to sort of soften the blow of the fact that Brandon Lee passed away making this movie, was this Jane Saberry song called uh, It Can't Rain All the Time, which, or, which is supposed to be one of the songs that Eric Draven's band sings in, in the world of the crow, you know, it can't rain all the time. And what we hear of the song in the movie is so far removed from what this song is. It's the only thing I felt like was weak about the soundtrack. And when it starts at the credits, it's sort of like, oh, what the hell is this? <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I'm not really digging this. Everything else was so, you know, driving. I remember playing the hell out of um, a cassette copy I'd made of a friend's CD before I'd won the CD off the radio station. And then even once I got the CD, I, I was making mixtapes all the time because we didn't have iPods or Discman at the time yet. I had a Walkman and I just listened to the hell out of that Crow soundtrack, man. That was awesome. And so I, I bought the City of Angels soundtrack before I saw the movie because that had the Rob, the White Zombie, I'm Your Boogeyman cover. It also had Hole's Gold Dust Woman cover. Um, Naked Cousin by PJ Harvey that's a big one and that's like the song that's playing when he first dons his crow outfit in the second movie third movie was direct to TV so I didn't see it but then when I eventually did see it I thought it wasn't so bad and that one Eric Mabius is playing the crow character it also features Kirsten Dunst and Fred Ward um, I feel like there's somebody else I'm forgetting about as well, but yeah, it was it was different. It was a little bit closer to the first one, I guess. And then there's the Crow Wicked Prayer, featuring of all people, Eddie Furlong is the Crow character. Um, he's also got Tara Reid and Eric Boreanaz in there. Um, Dennis Hopper. I mean, I, just looking at the the few scenes I've seen in, in sort of recap of the franchise videos on YouTube, I'm just like, this has got to be a joke. I cannot believe this actually exists. And even Danny Trejo's in there, which you know, I think Danny Trejo is a treat and a treasure in anything that he's in. But this just seems ridiculous. Um, so I have not seen that, and I'm not going to see it. And then there was a Mark Damascus. TV show made out of in Canada called The Crow Stairway to Heaven. Uh, they did one season, 22 episodes. Very much um, an attempt to sort of translate the first film into a serialized program. You know, maybe at the time it was more acceptable, but that's if if the reaction my six and a half year younger fiance and her friends had to the first movie would be the reaction I would have to this TV show. I'm usually pretty forgiving. I like to watch a lot of old shows like Forever Night movie shows that kind of really show the limitations they had of production at the time. But for some reason, what they were able to do with it was enough. Twin Peaks, you know, Surrealist. But some of these shows that were mainstreamed and just look like cheesy garbage, unfortunately, that's what this looks like in any footage I've seen from it. So probably won't go too far into trying to find any copies of that anywhere. But ultimately, this is a very strange love letter to The Crow, but it is a love letter to The Crow. I think it stands up pretty well, uh, unless you're six and a half years younger than me, and then you probably don't know what the hell I'm talking about. But give it a chance. Watch it with an open mind. That's what you got to do. In any case, we have taken a very long coffee break here. Our bosses are all looking for us to get back to our desk. So I'm going to say thank you so much for checking in. Thank you for hanging out, listening to your favorite movie chatter upper guy around the water cooler here at the 15 minutes of movie memory madness podcast. 
If you've got some ideas for movies that are from the sort of era that I've been swimming in in the pool here that you might want me to take a look at, you can hit me up at hollow9podcast at gmail.com. That's the word hollow, the number nine, I-N-E, podcast, all one word, at gmail.com. And uh, let me know what's going on. Or you could, you know, <laughs> like, subscribe, comment, help the algorithm help us. And, uh, yeah, check out all the links in the uh, show notes there for other ways that you can uh, read reach out and support the Hall Nine network. And uh, until the next time I'll see you at the movies that we watch on our own TVs at home. Right. You've been listening to the Hall Nine network, bringing you the very best in fan made media. That's the word hollow, the number nine I N E find the Hall Nine network on Facebook, Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat. Rate and review us on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, or wherever you find your podcasts. Email us at hollow9podcast at gmail.com. Leave us your feedback. Join in the conversation and be a part of the action. Join in the fun. Hollow 9.